we shut that door? One. Will you shut that door? Yeah, she, she can she can come in. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Flynn. I am the city council president. Viewers can watch the council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash city council dash TV. I would like to ask my colleagues and those in attendance uh, to please silence their phones and electronic devices. Thank you. I'd also like to ask everyone to be respectful and do not disrupt the meeting while you are here. If you are disruptive, you will be asked to leave. And if you fail to comply, you will be escorted out. Uh, please also note that according to city council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Councilor Arroyo. Present. Councilor Baker. Here. Councilor Bork. Present. Councilor Braden. Present. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Flaherty. Here. Councilor Flynn. Here. Councilor Lara. Present. Councilor Louis Jen. Present. Councilor Mejia. Here. <laughs> Councilor Murphy. Present. And Councilor Worrell. A president. Quorum is present, Mr. President. Thank you. I have been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. Uh, this week's clergy um, is Pastor Kiki, invited by City Council at Lujan. Um, City Council Lujan, would you like to come to the podium at this time and in introduce our clergy for today? Thank you, President Flynn. Um, there's a lot, there's a packed house, a lot going on today, so I won't take up too much time. I wanna, uh, today's actually Haitian Flag Day, and for those of you who know, I'm Haitian American. It's the most celebrated holiday in Haitian culture. I wanna thank Councilor Arroyo for switching days with me so that we could honor Dis We May, um, Haitian Flag Day. Um, it is, um, you know, in 1803, one of the leaders of the revolution, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, cut apart the French flag with a sword, um, cutting out the white part, demonstrating his desire to break away from France. So in the beginning, the Haitian flag was just blue and red. Um, he gave the pieces to his goddaughter, Catherine Flan, a seamstress, who stitched them back together while leaving out the central white strip. The colors of the new flag took on a new racialized meaning. The blue and red stripes represented a union between the black and mulatto citizens of Haiti. Over the years, it evolved to include this white center and a coat of arms that says L'Union Fait La Force. Um, I want to invite up Pastor Kiki uh, to give the prayer to honor Haitian Flag Day. Pastor Dieu Fleurissant, who I know as Pastor Kiki, and many of us know as Pastor Kiki, is a leader in the Haitian community, um, executive pastor at Mattapan's Voice of the Tab Tabernacle Church, um, and serves uh, the Haitian community in so many ways as a board of director for uh, the Haitian Americans United, executive director of the True Alliance Center, and he's also worked tremendously with the Immigrant Family Services Institute and Health Equity Now and Beyond to ensure vaccinations um, in our communities, our, in, in our immigrant and black and brown communities. So um, I welcome Pastor Kiki, and I also do this tribute today of Haitian Flag Day in honor of my classmate, high school classmate, Kervin Alouader, who last uh, Thursday at the tender age of 34 years old passed away from cancer after a 15 year battle. He was a very proud Haitian American and uh, the light of our class um, at Boston Latin School. So I just, uh, this tribute is in his name. Uh, Pastor Kiki. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Councilor Louis Joel. Would you please stand as we are about to pray? Thank you so much. Thank you, all the, the municipal leaders, elected officials. Thank you, the mayor who walked with us in the parade last Sunday. It's still turbulent times that we are going through from the word of Isaiah 41.10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will help you with my righteous hand. Lord, we know that your word reminds us over and over that we do not have to fear. We know that you are with us and your protection and presence as well as your power. We ask that you would cover us and remind us that you have stationed your angels around each and every one of us to guard us in all our ways. Thank you for being neither a God that never sleeps nor slumbers. You are constantly watching over us, constantly aware, so we can get some rest 
and some rest and some sleep in the midst of storms and tornadoes. We choose faith over fear. Help us to choose love over hatred. Help us to choose unity over division and help us to choose understanding over distraction. Help us to choose peace, shalom over war. Right now we ask that you would surround us with your peace. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. Lord, our hearts are broken from what happened last weekend in Buffalo. We feel such sadness, such huge grief. We miss our loved ones die from COVID. Nothing can fill this void we have deep inside. We thank you for your reminder that you are near to the brokenhearted and so those who are crushed in spirit. Please, dear God, bring your comfort and your help. Soothe the pain in our hearts. Send us gentle reminders that your presence is constantly with all of us today. We know that you will turn those circumstances around somehow for good. We believe that you will bring us through all storms in life as you did it for the past two years during the pandemic. We choose to hope in you and in you alone. As many people address you by many names, I pray to your precious son name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And, and those that are able, please, please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor, and thank you, uh, Council Eugen. Thank you, Pastor, for those warm <coughs> words and in prayer for, the, for this body and for our city. We're going to go into the first order of business, which is the approval of the minutes. Seeing and hearing no discussion on this matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the, the last meeting as presented. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. Thank you. <clears throat> the minutes have been have been passed. Um, we're going to take a, a few things out of order, and at this time, we're going to do the um, swearing in ceremony and formal documents that we need to vote on as well. Um, so I'd like to invite the mayor. Uh, mayor Wu, we're honored to have you back to the council. Uh, thank you for being with us, Mayor Wu. And Councilor-elect Coletta um, to come up to the podium for the swearing in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to be taking docket 0632 out of order. Um, we will now take things out of order, as I mentioned, to vote to accept docket 0632, which certifies the, the results of the May 3rd election held for the office of Di District 1 City Council. This will allow our new colleague, uh, Gigi Coletta, to be sworn in today and participate in today's council hearing. Um, Mr. Clerk, if you would read docket 0632. Docket number 0632. Communication was received by the city clerk from Anita Tavares, chair of the Boston Election Commissioners, certifying the results of the May 3rd, 2022 election held for the office of District 1 City Councilor. From the city uh, election department to Alex Jurntis, interim clerk, city of Boston, from Anita Tavares, Chair, Boston Election Department, May 16, 2022, regarding May 3, 2022 special municipal election. 
For your records, listed below is the candidate elected to the office of District 1 City Councilor held on May 3rd, 2022 at the Special Municipal Election in Boston. District City Councilor elected for a two-year term to fill vacancy, Gabriella Gigi Coletta, 99 Trenton Street, District 1. Certified results are attached. Sincerely, Anita Tavares, Chair, Board of Election Commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. All those in favor of accepting docket 0632 say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0632 has been accepted and will be placed on file. Um, at this time, I would like to invite Mayor Wu and Councilor Elect Coletta to come up and um, begin the swearing in. Um, Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first, I want to say it's always wonderful to be back. Old habits kind of stick. I accidentally voted to accept the, and approve the minutes <laughs> from last meeting, so, but I held off in this last vote. Um, I also want to invite the Coletta family to please come up and be present and, and stand with us during the ceremony. So as uh, Cherished family is coming up here, I'll, I'll just comment that um, here we have someone who is stepping into this role who has been doing the work for a long time. Gigi knows every part of this building, having uh, served alongside giants in this role before and at other levels of government, and more importantly, she knows every part of the district already, in addition to a very brief, uh, quick, special election campaign, she has been serving in these roles and serving the community for many, many years. So I'm incredibly honored to see her step into this role and for all of the work that is ahead um, and all of the incredible leadership that I know you will continue to demonstrate and to bring into fruition. I want to recognize that as part of that journey, there are many others who um, serve in office now and have served who are so proud and cheering you on as well. Of course, uh, the documentary filmmaker Lydia Edwards, who is capturing every moment of this, state senator. State representatives Adrian Madero and Aaron Michaelwitz are here. Former city councilor Anissa Savi George is here. Former City Councilor Sala Martina is here. <laughs> oh, and I see former, former, former City Councilor Diane Modica is here as well. <laughs> Did I miss anyone? No? Okay, and of course we see community leaders from East Boston, from Charlestown, from the North End, all gathered here as well. Okay, so um, first, would you like to introduce your family and then I'll... So I'm incredibly lucky to be surrounded by amazing individuals who um, showed me the way. So I just wanna introduce my sister, Angela. She's seven months pregnant, she's still here, she's amazing. Um, <laughs> Sebastian Zapata, my partner. Um, my grandmother, Helen Coletta, is here, the matriarch of the family. My father, Edmund Coletta, and my mom, Nina Gaeta Coletta. Okay, so we, we're going to administer three separate oaths to the Commonwealth, to the city, and to the United States of America. I, Gabriella Coletta, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that, I will bear true faith and allegiance, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and will support the Constitution thereof, and will support the Constitution thereof so help me God. I, Gabriella Coletta, I, Gabriella Coletta do, solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully and impartially, that I will faithfully and impartially discharge, and perform discharge and perform all the duties incumbent on me 
all the duties incumbent upon me as a member of the City Council of the City of Boston. As a member of the City Council of the City of Boston. According to the best of my ability and understanding. According to the best of my ability and understanding. Agreeably. Ag agreeably to the rules and regulations. The rules and regulations. Of the Constitution and the laws of this Commonwealth. Of the Constitution and the laws of this Commonwealth. So help me God. So help me God. I, Gabriella Coletta. I, Gabriella Coletta. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. Congratulations. Signing the official book. Sure, Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'm very lucky. Uh, Boston City Council President Ed Flynn had told me I'm able to give some brief remarks. That doesn't count as my maiden speech, so I will certainly take advantage of that. Um, but I promise I will be brief because I know we have a packed agenda. I just want to say thank you, Mayor Wu, distinguished guests, and now my colleagues on the council, and everyone for being here to share this incredible day with me. As a former City Council staffer, I have a unique appreciation and reverence for these chambers. From being an Eastie kid coming in here with my mom to advocate for our community to my first day here as a staffer, I stand before you now deeply honored and humbled to be Boston City Councilor for District 1. I'm in full acknowledgement and awareness of who and what uh, it took to bring us here together today. So in this moment, I want to create and share this space in gratitude with you all. There are some special people in my life who I will recognize first, and that is my family. I mentioned them briefly. Um, but I just want to first recognize the matriarch of my family, uh, Helen Coletta. So happy you could be here today, Grandma. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to recognize my grandparents who are here watching over us, um, the late Edmund Coletta Sr., the late Alessandro Gaeta, and the late Celia Trujillo. Please watch over me and guide me on this journey. My parents, Edmund Coletta and Nita Gaeta Coletta, Dad, thank you for instilling the values of kindness, humility, and service to the community. Thank you. Mom, um, if I say if I, have, if I have sharp elbows, she's the one to thank. Uh, thank you for my activist spirit and how to not only break the ceiling, but how to swing the hammer. Thank you. My sister and hype woman, Angela Coletta Acevedo. <laughs> my brother and political strategist, Chris couldn't make it here today. He lives in Baltimore, but I know he's here with me today. And my incredible partner, Sebastian Zapata. I could not have done this without you. Where are you? I could not have done this without you. Thank you. Of course, uh, to the incredible elected officials who are here, Mayor Wu, thank you for already pushing us to aim higher and to be bold. You're already making history, and I so look forward to working with you. Thank you. Other elected officials who are here, Diane Monica, I am here because you did everything. I stand on your shoulders. You were the first, so thank you. I also have Sal Amatina here. Thank you, Sal. And I believe Paul Scapicchio will be joining us in just a little bit. And then also the uh, state delegation. Uh, state Rep. Aaron Mikowitz, thank you so much for everything. State Rep. Dan Ryan, he's not here, but thank you, Dan. Uh, and State Rep. Adrian Madero. It only took seven years to go from little sister to colleague, but I'm so happy <laughs> to do this work with you. <laughs> state Senator Lydia Edwards. It's Lydia with a Y. <laughs> I told you to the moon and back. Always. Thank you for teaching me to shine my brightest light. And a special recognition to the Boston City Council uh, and President Ed Flynn, his staff and central staff for accommodating uh, and welcoming me on my first day. And to my colleagues on the Boston City Council, what an impressive group of powerhouse individuals. I look out at all of you and I realize that this is Boston. And I'm happy to be here. 
And I'm just in awe in every single one of you and what you've accomplished as a body this year. We are here because we believe in the power of municipal government and how it can better the lives of residents. We are here to ensure a vibrant, resilient, and equitable city for everybody. We are here to bring the voices of those in our communities to the halls of power. And I look forward to learning from each and every single one of you and what your lived perspective is and ensuring that we can build a brighter Boston for everyone. The work literally starts today. We have a working session at 3 p.m., so I will see you there. Um, and I know that we will not agree on everything, and there will be some tough conversations ahead of us. But I promise to be collaborative, to work towards consensus and compromise, and to let the work be the motivation and not the politics. I want to be sure to recognize the district that raised me, that gave me everything, and elected, to, elected me to represent them on the Boston City Council. Charlestown, East Boston, and the North End, I love you. You have my heart always. Each is uniquely beautiful, and each has its own set of challenges. But I know looking at this room and those in the community, there's nothing too big for us to tackle together. For my neighbors and constituents, you have my commitment to be bold, to speak truth to power, to fight for your interests, to be inclusive and welcoming of all people, no matter who you are or where you come from, especially our immigrant brothers and sisters. I promise to be accessible and responsive, and you have my commitment that I will center your voice in every conversation and action. I promise to serve with empathy, with compassion, and with a little bit of that Eastie grit that I got from my mama. I won't be perfect, but I ask for your grace and for your partnership in this work to learn, grow, and mobilize with me. The work starts today, and I cannot wait to get started. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, Mayor Wolf, for being with us today. And we're proud of you, and you're welcome to the council anytime. And thank you to some of the city employees that are here with us as well to experience today's day. Um, the mayor mentioned the former elected officials that are that are here. Um, I was going to do that, but. <laughs> Um, I don't think they need to be uh, recognized twice, though. So. Um, Mr. Cora, can you, can you um, have the record reflect that Councilor Fernandez Anderson is here? Yes. And Councilor Coletta is here. We're going to go back to the original start of the agenda, and we do have several, several groups that are here with us today, so we wanted to <clears throat> take this opportunity to, to recognize them. Um, so one of the groups that we have, um, Councilor Lujan already, already mentioned, um, was a poet and performer, and we also have another special guest from Councillor Murphy, as, as you can see, our dedicated and professional EMS staff is here as well, Chief Hooley. Um, so at this time, I'm going I'm to ask Councillor Lujan to um, please introduce our performer for today. We usually have one performer um, each week, but this was a, a special exception, so we are having two. Um, Two today. Come up. Come, come on up, Councillor. 
Thank you, President Flynn, and welcome to our new colleague, uh, Councillor Gigi Coletta. Looking forward to working with you. Um, so in continuation, today's Haitian Flag Day. Last Friday, many of you joined us for a wonderful breakfast that we had out on City Hall Plaza. Um, and, but I wanted to bring a bit of that spirit um, into the chamber today, given that today is a day of the Flag Day. Um, and with me, I have Originations. Um, founded in 1994 by artistic director Shamba Dibinga, Origination is a nonprofit that produces innovative and dynamic performing arts programs, which motivate, challenge, and inspire you to be the best they can be. Uh, they offer quality dance, theater, arts, and African history education. Um, and I have friends who've been in Originations, and I'm so glad that we could have them here today. Um, performing for us will be ninth grader, ninth grader Alana for LaForest, who herself is Haitian American, resident of Rosendale, ninth grader All Star. And to those of you who were here last Friday and saw the Mattahunt School um, perform, uh, they're a dual emergent school, a dual immersion school in Mattapan where they uh, take classes in Haitian Creole and in English. Um, she works with them. So she's just an all around all star ninth grader at Boston Line Academy who's here to sing for us and read us a poem. So without further ado, Alana. I just want to thank Councilor Leo Jean for that beautiful introduction. So <laughs> to begin, I will be singing the Haitian um, anthem. So I can, can I ask that all rise for the Next, I will be reciting a poem written by Shamba Yenja Dabinga, and then I will translate it into Haitian Creole for, um, in honor of Haitian Flag Day. So. I love myself. I love my brown skin, the bend of my hair, my dark brown eyes, and the way that I stare. I love my physique, the way that I walk, the way that I smile, and the way that I talk. I am unique. I am one of a kind. There is no one like me in this world so divine. I'm an original. Can't ask for more than that. When I was created, the whole world jumped back. I'm proud to be me. These hips and these lips, the fullness of my nose, and the fall of my twist. I am me, and I love myself. And now for the Haitian translation. Mwen l'aime, c'est mwen. Mwen l'aime, pour ma own, mwen a. Kubena shevim, genwa maon, mwen yo ak fason mwen gade. Mwen eme fizik mwen, ak fason mwen mache. Mwen inik, mwen se yu nan yon kalite. Pagen okyen lot tanku mwen nan lemon. Mwen original, mwen pa kamande pou plis pase sa. Le mwen te kleye le mwen antye vole tou nem. Mwen fye de tet mwen. Ran sa, bous sa, nen sa, ak cheve to de sa yo. Mwen se mwen, e mwen eme tet mwen. So just want to say thank you to Alana, thank you to Shamba, you reached out and were like, how can I help? And I'm glad to have you here. I know that so many of us here are so big fans of yours. I know Councilor Mejia has been a long time fan, so just thank you for all you do for our young kids and making them know their history and being able to celebrate Haitian Flag Day. And thank you to President Flynn for allowing this moment to happen. So thank you. There you go.
Thank you, Councillor June. And that performance was, was excellent. The poem was excellent and the song, the national anthem was excellent. Um, our next presentation is by Councillor Murphy. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask Councillor Murphy to please come up um, at this time. Thank you, President Flynn. So, and thank you and congratulations. It's nice to see that someone's sitting in the seat again. Welcome, it's wonderful. So, dating, um, Boston EMS professionals provide life-saving services every day and risk their lives each time they answer the call of service for our city. Boston Emergency Medical Services is one of three public safety agencies that respond to 911 calls in the city of Boston. Their department cares for patients with clinical proficiency, professionalism, and compassion. They have been frontline leaders in helping our communities combat the COVID-19 pandemic, the opioid epidemic, and citywide emergencies. In, tw in 2021 alone, EMS professionals have answered the call for over 126,000 clinical incidences, 160 1,577 life support responses and 79,210 transports, serving residents across the city in every neighborhood. In addition, regarding COVID-19, the Boston EMS have cared for tens of thousands of suspected COVID-19 patients, over 7,800 confirmed positive residents, and they have administered more than 2,300 COVID-19 vaccinations. This year's National EMS Week theme is rising to the challenge, something members of the Boston EMS have exemplified during the COVID-19 pandemic and always before that also. Earlier this week, I attended the graduation ceremony alongside EMS Chief James Hooley and Councillor Baker and Bach and celebrated the graduation of the largest class, the graduating class of 30 EMTs. This class, was the largest in over a decade, and we saw the next class has already started. They're two weeks in. We will give the, this will give the EMS a boost to continue their service to our Boston community and residents. In short, I ask that the Boston City Council join me in honoring the contributions of the Boston Emergency Medical Service Department and EMS Chief Hooley and all of his workers his, and recognize that May 15th through May 21st as Boston Emergency Medical Service Week. So thank you. And thank you also yesterday for being here for the budget hearing. That was wonderful. Yes. No, thank, uh, Thank you. I, I know you got a busy day. Thank you for uh, thinking of us this week. Uh, this this body's been uh, tr uh, terrific. I, as long as I can remember, the city council has done something like this for us. Uh, we we typically try to get a little bit bigger group, but everyone's kind of busy today, too, as well. Uh, uh, Deputy uh, Alexander, who you met yesterday at the uh, hearing. Today is working a, a grill at Shirley Street in Roxbury as we're attempting to feed uh, people on all three shifts, uh, delivering food out to them today. That's the, we, the command staff, we all have to take turns at it today. So she's busy and uh, one of our other deputies unfortunately got injured in a, uh, uh, a minor accident yesterday and she couldn't make it today. But anyway, thank you all very much. Uh, rising to the occasion is the theme this year and uh, how rising, uh, is uh, uh, the council was saying, and uh, you know, we, we want to be there. Uh, we want you all to be able to count on us, depend on us, and thank you for all the support that you give us uh, every day that makes that possible. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask my colleagues to please join us for a photo, and then the second photo, I'm going to ask the Haitian delegation if we can do a second, um, a second group photo as well. So if my council colleagues could please join us and then please stay up here and then we'll ask the um, Haitian delegation if they could um, come up immediately thereafter.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, while we're waiting for the second photo, I do just want to thank Councillor Braden for co-sponsoring this with me. I did not mention that, sorry. <laughs> We're going to do the second. We're going to do the second photo now. Thank you. Communications from Her Honor the Mayor. Mr. Kerr, can you please read docket 0625 to 0628 together, please? Docket number 0625, message in order for your approval in order to reduce the fiscal year 22 appropriation from the reserve for collective bargaining by $123,291 to provide funding for various departments for the fiscal year 22 increases contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston Public Health Commission and AFSCME Council 93. Docket number 0626, message in order for the supplemental appropriation order for the Boston Public Health Commission for fiscal year 22 in the amount of $123,291 to cover the fiscal year 22 cost items contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston Public Health Commission and AFSCME Council 93. The terms of the contracts are October 1st, 2020 through September 30th, 2023. The major provisions of the contract include base wages of 2%, 1.5% and 2% to be given in January of each fiscal year of the contract term filed in the office of the city clerk on March 21st, 2022, filed on May 16th, 2022 as well. Docket number 0627, message in order for the approval in order to reduce fiscal year 22 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $94,113 to provide funding for the inspection service department for fiscal year 22 increases contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and the Office and Professional Employees International Union, Local 6, OPEIU. Docket number 0628, message in order for the supplemental appropriation order for the Inspectional Services Department for fiscal year 22 in the amount of $94,113 to cover the fiscal year 22 cost contained within the collective cost items within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and the Office and Professional Employee International Union Local 6, OPEIU. The terms of the contract are July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2023. The major provisions of the contract include base wage increases of 2%, 1.5% and 2% to be given in October of each fiscal year of the contract term, filed in the office of the city clerk May 16, 2022. Docket number 0629, message in order for your approval in order to reduce fiscal year 22 appropriation for the, for the reserve for collective bargaining by $5,473 to provide funding for the Boston Police Department for the fiscal year 22 increases contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and the New York Typographical Union. Mes uh, 
Docket number 0630. Message in order for the uh, supplemental appropriation order for the Boston Police Department for fiscal year 22 in the amount of $5,473 to cover fiscal year 22 cost items contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston Police Department and the New York Typographical Union. The terms of the contracts are October 1, 2020 through September 30th, 2023. The major provisions of the contract include base wage increases of 2%, 1.5%, and 2% to be given in September of each fiscal year of the contract term, filed in the office of the city clerk on May 16, 2022. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. So dockets 0625, to 0628 will be referred to the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology. On docket 0629, 0630, the Chair recognizes Council Bach. Council Bach is the Chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, we, uh, for the four doc prior dockets, we'll have a hearing to discuss the particulars, um, but with this specific, um, the $5,000 appropriation in 0629 and 0630, um, that's really for just two workers, and it's, uh, it's exactly the same as the agreement that the council already approved for Ask Me 93, so it's the identical deal, and I think in the interest of letting those two workers get their back pay and because there's no further information that the council hasn't already heard from the administration, I wanted to move for suspension and passage of dockets 0629 and 0630. Thank you, Council Block. Council Block seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0629. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Block seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0630. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0631. Docket number 0631, message transmitting certain information under section 17F regarding the Mission Hill K through 8 school. Docket number 0591, passed by the council on May 4th, 2022. Thank you. The docket will be placed on file. Reports of public offices and others. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0633. Docket number 0633. Notice was received from the mayor for absence from the city on Tuesday, May 17, 2022, from 11 a.m. until 9.05 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Docket 0633 will be placed on file. Matters recently heard for possible <coughs> action. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0480 to 0482. Docket 0483, docket 0484 to 0486, and docket 0492 together, please. Docket number 0480 through 0482, orders for the fiscal year 23 operating budget, including annual appropriations for depart departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits, also known as OPEP. Docket number 0483, order for capital fund transfer appropriations. Docket numbers 0484 through 0486, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. And docket number 0492, message and order authorizing a, a limit for the Boston Centers for Youth and Families, BCYF, We're revolving fund for fiscal year 2023 to pay salaries and benefits of employees and to purchase supplies and equipment necessary to operate the city hall child care. This revolving fund shall be credited with any and all receipts from tuition paid by parents and guardi or guardians for children enrolled at the center. Receipts and resulting expenditures from this fund shall not, ex not exceed more than $900,000. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson Chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, President Flynn. The Committee on Ways and Means continued to hold hearings for um, uh, to review the FY23 budget dockets on docket 0480 to 0486. And on Thursday, uh, we heard from, well, we've, heard, we've held six public hearings so far this week um, with at least um, 
all of my council colleagues in attendance, alternating in attendance. Um, on Thursday, we heard from Boston, Public, Boston um, Police Department. At 10 a.m., we heard from Boston Commissioner's Office, the Bureau of Professional Development, the Bureau of Professional um, Standards, Bureau of Community Engagement, and Bureau of Field Services. At 2 p.m., then we heard from Bureau of Admin and Technology, Bureau of Investigative, um, Investigative Services, and the Bureau of Intelligence and Analysis. Then on Monday, we were joined um, in the chamber at 10 a.m. by um, the Boston Center for Youth and Families, BCYF, where we discussed their budget and revolving funds. At 4 p.m. Uh, on Monday, also on Monday, we hosted Youth Employment and Engagement, YEE. Yesterday, we were joined for two sessions um, by the Boston Public Health Commission. 10 a.m., we heard from Child, Adolescent, and Family Health, Community Initiatives, and Infectious Diseases. Um, later at 2 p.m., we heard from um, Emergency Medical Services, Homeless Services, and reco Recovery Services. Um, so, and tomorrow uh, we'll be hosting um, the Office of Equity, Resiliency, and Racial Equity um, at 10 a.m. And then two, we will hold, we will have um, in attendance the Boston of the Office of Immigrants Advancement and the Office of Women's Advancement. And this afternoon we will have our second working session to discuss FY23 um, budget at 3 p.m. in the Piemonte room. Over the next weeks. We will continue to review the FY23 budget and uh, with additional departments and also council work concessions. I recommend that these matters remain in committee. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Uh, docket 0480 to 0482, docket 0483, docket 0484 to 0486, docket 0492 will remain in committee. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0634. Docket number 0634, Council Alara offered the following. Order for a hearing to discuss the creation of a civilian construction details program. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I am excited to rise today to present this hearing order <clears throat> and to start the conversation about the creation of a civilian construction detail program for the city of Boston. In 2018, Massachusetts was the last state in the entire country to legalize civilian construction details. Here in Boston, the Boston police officers are the only city employees who work construction details, and the Boston Police Department currently doesn't have the capacity to fulfill all of the requests that we get. In 2020, officers declined to work 42.71% of the details, which is up from 32% of the details that went unworked in 2017. This is representing 135,959 hours that residents could have worked. The current rate of unemployment, specifically among black people in Boston, is 6.8%. And over the past four decades, black people in the United States have experienced nearly double the rate of unemployment compared to their white counterparts. Moreover, black people have disproportionately be imp been impacted by job loss during the COVID-19 crisis, with employment rates that peaked at 16.9% versus 2.8% among white people. The fact is that our people need jobs and we have work to give them. Private companies requested an average of 117,066 details for construction sites in Boston annually between 2017 and 2020. This is representing $71,557,762 each year in potential wages for Boston residents or a total of 740, 740 full-time positions at $70,000 plus benefits. A civilian construction detail office could operate on an annual budget of tens of thousands of millions of dollars with a mission of gender and racial justice and equity to employ hundreds of residents who are most harmed by state violence, over-policing, and mass incarceration. And the city of Boston is already exploring these kind of workforce development programs with our very own Green Youth Jobs Initiative, Power Corps. Creating a civilian construction detail office creates hundreds of union jobs at prevailing wages with benefits for Boston residents, particularly residents who have been excluded from the economy or struggle to provide for themselves and their families because of their quarry. 
Residents who represent diverse cultures and speak multiple languages have pride in their communities and could staff a civilian construction detail office with a mission of racial and gender justice to promote safety, well-being, and prosperity in neighborhoods all across our city. If this moves forward, we would work to um, amend the municipal code. We would work with public safety officials on implementation and our office has already started brokering conversations with local unions who would be more than happy to welcome these workers into their ranks. Thank you. Thank you, Council Alara. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Royal. Council Royal, you have the floor. Thank you. I don't think I have to add too much after what Councilor Lara said. The, the one thing that I always come back to uh, on civilian details is the alleged purpose of these details is safety. Uh, and if we are saying that we are mandating details for safety, having nearly 50% of them unfilled is a safety failure. And so if we're going to actually continue to do details on the basis that it's for public safety and for traffic safety, then we can't continue to see 40, 50% of these going unfilled because that means that that purpose isn't being met. Uh, and so I think the uh, clear issue here is that the Boston Police Force doesn't have the capacity to fill all of these. I don't think they're making a, a decision not to fill these as much as they just don't have the capacity to actually fill all of the details that come before us and being limited to just Boston police officers filling those details is actually creating a safety void for 40 something percent of details in the city of Boston. And so we have to meet that. And I think the only way to meet that is to expand and sort of make it a civilian based program. I know that uh, often what gets flipped around is the idea of saving money, but this is less about not paying people prevailing wages. I think we should be paying people prevailing wages and good union jobs, but we should be meeting that safety need. And in order to do that, it means essentially changing the way we do business when it comes to civilian details. Uh, and so I look forward to this conversation. Uh, I think it's, it's overdue, frankly. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Uh, President Flynn. Thank you. You want your name signed on, Councilor Roy? Yes, please. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak on this matter? Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to my colleague. I rise to um, please ask that you add my name to uh, this, as well as want to uplift that you are definitely meeting the moment in 2020 um, during my first budget season. Um, this is what people were streaming for. Um, and I'm so incredibly grateful for your courage to step in and actually answer that call. So looking forward to this hearing, um, and I'm hoping that it'll end up in the Workforce Development Committee so that we can expedite <laughs> it as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, President Flynn. I applaud uh, my counselor, uh, my sister, uh, Council Lara, and I think that, you know, such programs could also function as an incubator for workforce as well as um, for those who's interested in construction um, and other related trades, of course. And I think additionally, the program could also possibly serve as an educational function um, through by way of community members via public forums or um, social media and trainings. Um, so in short, I second my colleagues uh, <coughs> offering. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Please also add my name. Um, I was uh, thrilled to see Councilor Lara filing this. I think when we pulled those numbers back in 2020 and found that half of them weren't being filled, we were all kind of astounded. I want to register that I think part of this conversation is going to be uh, the council again articulating its interest in reform in the police contract because some of the provisions that shape the way these get allocated um, are in there, and that was one of the things we ran into before. Um, but I agree that it's it's like it's an opportunity for us to um, talk about workforce development and just access to great jobs. And I think one of the great things, Councillor Arroyo touched on it, but I think people should know is that in Massachusetts, the state law actually said that if these jobs go to civilian flaggers, you have to be paying the prevailing wage. So it is not a case, unlike in some states, of creating kind of like poverty jobs that replace it's about you know, really lifting everybody up. I'm so excited about that. And uh, not to not to start a quarrel, but um, I do think since Councillor Lara is proposing a, a new city department that it might also be a city services um, uh, committee thing. So just wanted to register that. Thank you, Council Bach. <clears throat> anyone else like to speak on it? Would anyone um, 
I'd like to add their name, please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councillor Braden, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Jean, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Royal, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Bach. Um, anyone else? Okay. Docket 0634 will be assigned to the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0635. Docket number 0635, Councillor Fernandez Anderson offer the following. Order for a hearing to discuss ways of creating a partnership between colleges and high schools that will create jobs and academic supports for students. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Councillor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Um, thank you. Um, earlier, I, just so you know, I forgot to do my slogan. When you said Councillor Fernandez Anderson, you said eight ways it means, I was gonna be like, where the money resides, where the money resides, but then I forgot, and then it's just too late. So I'll just go on to uh, talking about this one now. Um, so I think that you know the possibility of getting academic support to our high school youth uh, via partnering between area colleges and high school is super exciting. I wonder if we can discuss an, uh, this opportunity in terms of how we can hold colleges accountable uh, by a way of uh, some sort of uh, community benefit or pilot program where they can uh, compensate lower uh, socioeconomic class uh, or lower income students to tutor high school students um, and then create by, and also creating jobs to our high school or stipend <coughs> Um, as a compensation. So creating this incentive to get high schools, the 2T would get uh, compensated, and the tutor would also uh, be employed. Um, and so a partnership between the city and area colleges and high schools to get um, academic supports to our high schools is uh, important and vital, and I hope you guys can support uh, this idea. Thank you. Oh, and I'd also like to um, add uh, Councillor Ruzi Lujan and Councillor Mejia to um, this order. Thank you. Hearing, hearing no objection, Councillor Lujan and Councillor Mejia uh, so, at, so added. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? The Chair recognizes Councillor Lujan. Councillor Lujan. You have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you, Councillor Fernando Anderson, for offering this. Um, many of the students in our city um, have no choice but to work um, and sometimes have to choose work over school because of family situations, uh, especially for our black and brown students, especially for our immigrant families. Um, and so it's whether, you know, and we see this all the time, and sometimes it's just because of spending money. A lot of us here started early. I started as soon as I was able to work, I was working. Um, that is why I think this is a really great idea so that we can provide stipends. Um, I'm a big fan of learning and earning. Um, give jobs to, fo to our young kids where they are able to learn and able to put some money in their pocket. Um, that was a big benefit for me um, and all of my sisters who started working when we were 14. Um, so we know that um, a lot of our students are dropping out. They're not finishing school as the rate of, uh, at the rate of, uh, of uh, their white peers. Um, and we know uh, that uh, a lot of them suffer from entrenched poverty that's rooted in cycles of uh, structural racism. Um, and so uh, they can't afford tutors for tests. And we know that all of our wonderful and really wealthy colleges um, have the capacity to give back more and be better neighbors here in Boston um, to our students who need it the most. So a stipend for studying program, as the counselor has um, offered, would be a win-win-win for our students for our schools and for our uh, local colleges and universities. It would pay dividends for the students who need resources to mo uh, and motivation to continue their academic pursuits and choose learning over you know, a, just a regular job. And for college students to take a leadership role and to really be invested in the city of Boston. Um, so I think this is a really great idea and I'm looking forward to partnering with Councillor Fernandez Anderson on this um, to make sure that we are um, incentivizing our young kids and really doing the work of making uh, giving giving them money so that they can so that they can learn. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jen. Uh, the chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to my colleague for adding me. What a beautiful surprise! Um, so I just uh, thank you, um, and I just would offer that 
you know, I always talk about the fact that I had three jobs while I was in high school, so um, working wasn't um, something that I felt was a privilege. It was really more about survival, and I think the more opportunities that we can create for young people to earn while they learn and also create a pipeline of um, being able to give back is, is important. So I'm, I'm happy to support this and look forward to having this involved in any of my committees, both as the Chair of Education and Workforce Development. This is a nice intersection of both. Um, I really do appreciate your leadership and your creativity about thinking outside the box. So thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to sign on to this? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Royal, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lara, Councilor Murphy, please add the chair. Docket 0635 will be assigned to the Committee on Pilot Agreements, Institutional and Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Relations. At this time, I just want to acknowledge um, a former colleague, uh, Boston City Councilor Paul Scapiccio. Paul, thank you for being with us today. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0636. Docket number 0636, Councilor Fernandez Anderson offered the following. Order for a hearing to discuss the initiation of a study that assesses life insurance needs for low-income residents. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Hello again. Uh, thank you, Council uh, President Flynn. Um, so I'm getting a little bit chatty this afternoon, and I know, and it's, it's gonna it's gonna settle down soon. Um, I offer you this order due to both historic discrimination uh, meted out of uh, prospective black and brown holders of life insurance and ongoing disparities in those who have coverage today. Um, so, so black people have often been charged higher insurance rates for the same policies that others receive at lesser price. Uh, due to this ongoing legacy of discrimination, a degree of distrust has developed, and many in the, uh, in the black community or black and brown community tend to overestimate the cost of life insurance. Uh, black women are least likely um, or least likely group to be insured, despite being largely responsible uh, for raising a good percentage of the family units uh, that they are a part of. Life insurance is an important financial resource to pass down. Those without it are in distinct disadvantage in terms of generational wealth. Uh, for these reasons and more, I offer this order to initiate a discussion in regards uh, to the life insurance needs of the poor and working class communities. Um, and I guess I'd just like to say that, you know, it's also a really good um, idea to have, to set up as a family, to set up a, your financial portfolio. And for poor families, um, they are often face this challenge of not being prepared. Unfortunately, um, I, we've all, I think, quoted the, the uh, research here that black and brown people die um, in Roxbury 30 years sooner than their counterparts in Back Bay. Um, and so oftentimes you see a lot of like sort of fundraisers last minute go fund me to bury their loved ones. Um, I think that this is, it would be a really good idea to just do a study just to sort of assess the need in Boston and how we can support our uh, poor and working class families. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Is anyone else um, looking to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to um, sign on to this matter? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Council Arroyo, Council Bach, Council Braden, Council Coletta, Council Flaherty, Council Lujan, Council Mejia, Council Murphy. Please add the chair. Um, Docket 0636 will be assigned to the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0637. Docket yeah. number 0637, Councilor Fernandez Anderson offered the following. Order for a hearing to discuss reinforcing fines or implementing funding for distressed 
distressed privately owned buildings and vacant lots. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. <coughs> Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. So I just got a note from my, co my colleague, Clarity. No, I'm not going to read it. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Listen, um, look, how did I end up talking uh, so much today? So I've, I've been talking with ISD and different departments and really looking into this issue in Roxbury in particularly. And we, you guys hear me talk a lot about the decrepit, sort of, you know, abandoned looking, neglected properties um, in Roxbury, right? Um, and seriously, uh, as we all know, there are dozens of lots around the city, particularly D7, and in surrounding uh, predominantly black and brown working class communities. Uh, these lots offer space um, where exciting and innovative ideas uh, could be occurring, and so also, you know, with a lot of these buildings too, some of some of some of the issue is we know that of from poor uh, families, they're not able to actually afford to repair um, their property, and some of them fall in different category and there's different technicalities that prevent them from repairing um, their property. So, I think it's it would be a good idea for us to start talking about what programs are already in place, funding that is left or not left um, from what I'm hearing from different departments is that the funding is actually very low at this point and the program is always at, almost at its end. So if we can actually discuss bringing it back, reinforcing fines to those who can afford it without um, disproportionately um, impacting uh, black and brown or poor families, obviously. And um, I would like to also add, as an original co-sponsor, Councillor uh, Worrell, I know he's um, not here, I don't know how that applies, but in Council Lujan uh, to this order. Thank you. The chair recognizes um, Council Lujan at this time. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to uh, Councilor Bernard Janison for offering this. Um, we know that we have an incredibly impossible real estate market right now, um, but still Boston finds itself with a lot of buildings um, that are uh, vacant or abandoned or uh, blighted, uh, and this has happened, this has been going on for years and years and years. Um, sometimes the reason is in part because speculators are, are land making, and they're holding onto land, they're letting the prices rise uh, while investing nothing and forcing neighbors um, to uh, live next to properties that are in desperate need of repair. Um, many times, but however, there are times when it's because the owner just doesn't have the money to keep up. Um, it's really expensive to get work done. The, the cost of labor is increasing. Um, so we need to continue to find ways to tell the difference between those, those two. Uh, the land baking by the investors and the homeowner um, who just can't afford to make the improvements necessary. Um, um, the other category of landowners who can't afford to should be supported with resources that uh, Councilor Renange Anderson was talking about. We need to make sure that we're uplifting, uplifting and supporting uh, the neighbors in the neighborhoods um, to be able to do something about the property that everyone can be proud of. I was on the phone yesterday and today with a constituent who was dealing with this very issue. Um, banks, grants, consulting, and programs all play a role in revitalization. And I know that there's a problem task force, uh, problem properties task force here. Uh, but how they work with community groups, neighborhood associations, city programs and grants still leave a lot to be desired. Um, we as a city can do better to help connect the resor connect resources and create them where necessary, um, especially in neighborhoods that have been historically disinvested, um, to make sure that each neighborhood is somewhere where you know we have we're building thriving neighborhoods uh, where we all feel like our neighborhoods affirm our dignity. So, uh, thank you for adding me as original co-sponsor, and I look forward to the work. Thank you, Council Jean, uh, Mr. Kirk. Please add um, Council Eugene as an original co-sponsor. Co Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to add Council Worrell since he's not here. Um, the chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, and thank you to the sponsors. And I just wanted to strongly say please add my name. I was uh, out walking with property management in Mission Hill yesterday um, talking about graffiti and just in general, all of these places where we see buildings that, you know, again and again, residents are reporting them, and it's coming back with that answer of either an investor owner whose absentee and can't be reached, 
or in some cases, a small business owner or residential order that just owner that just doesn't have the money. So I totally agree with the sponsors that we have to, we need a program that better distinguishes between those folks and that you know is providing support for the folks who need the resources and I think is providing more substantial penalties and penalties that really bite for folks who are intentionally leaving their properties until an investment, like an, a development opportunity arises and, and letting everyone else live with blight in the meantime. But I just wanted to strongly second this and please add my name. Thank you, Council Bork. The Chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Please add my name. Um, I uh, thank you so much for bringing this issue forward. Um, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Uh, the, 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 bus the other issue that I know my, our predecessor, um, Councilor Matt O'Malley, raised the issue about uh, vacant shop fronts and storefronts in our business districts and our main streets. Uh, it's a similar sort of issue. Um, that may or may not be rolled into this conversation, but uh, it's very detrimental to our main street districts to have uh, vacant shop fronts and uh, premises left vacant for long periods of time, years in some cases in our district, uh, because uh, an absentee uh, uh, landlord, landlord is just waiting for a more uh, profitable opportunity than perhaps a small local business that might use the premises. So uh, please add my name. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. Anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, yeah. you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to the sponsors. Please add my name. I'm really super enthusiastic um, about this, and I'd like to echo my colleagues' uh, sentiments, um, Councillor Breeden. Um, and last year, I believe it was, Councillor Bach and I um, embarked on another journey to really address um, the commercial vacancies that are happening in our community. Uh, those are all often distressed as well. And um, I think we have an opportunity to open up those storefronts and allow small businesses to incubate in those spaces. So I think that there's, um, there's some room in this discussion um, if, if the chair um, allows through the chair to also add um, commercial vacancies into this conversation because I think that is part of the whole community. So I wanted to just offer that as something that we can in include. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone else like to, uh, would anyone like to sign on? Please raise your hand. Mr. Cora, please add Council Arroyo, Council Baker, Council Bach, Council Braden, Council Coletta, Council of Flaherty, Council Mejia, Council Murphy, please add the chair. Um, docket 0637 will be assigned to the Committee on City Services, Innovation, Technology. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0638. Docket number 0638, Council of Flynn offered the following order for a hearing to discuss the possibility of allocating ARPA fund funds for the expansion of South Boston Community Health Center. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair now recognizes Council President Flynn. Council President Flynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council Royal. May I add Councilor Murphy and Councilor Flaherty as an original co-sponsors, please? Seeing no objections, they are so added. Councilor Flynn, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, the South Boston Community Health Center plays a critical role in our community. It provides many seniors with quality and compassionate medical care. We also have a strong behavioral and mental health component to it. We represent a large number of residents living in public housing and on uh, some type of assistance. Many of the residents are from Mary Ellen McCormick. Many residents are from West Broadway Development, um, Old, Old Colony, which is Ann Lynch as well, um, West 9th Street, which is another B, BHA facility. Um, many of the patients that are at the South Boston Community Health Center, uh, health center are, are communities of color. As I mentioned, 60% of the patients rely on some, for, some part of assistance. Uh, many are living below the poverty line. Um, during the height of the pandemic, the health center vaccinated over 35,000 people. There's also a vast increased demand, as I mentioned earlier, 
on behavioral health. I had the opportunity to visit recently and the number of young people and students seeking mental health counseling or behavioral counseling is increasing dramatically. Um, there is a proposed $20 million um, for the continued COVID response, another $18 million to augment behavioral health services. The expansion of the South Boston Community Health Center would, would serve to fulfill both of these proposed uses under ARPA funding. Um, they're expanding right next door, and, and, and again, part of the, that expansion is to, the, is to work on mental health counseling, behavioral health counseling. Um, I hope to have a hearing on this matter that it would be in the appropriate committee, but listen to residents, listen to the health center staff, listen to patients, community activists, partners on, on this uh, proposal. Thank you, Councilor Royal. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Uh, Councilor Flaherty, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Just uh, to echo the comments of my uh, colleague and our council president, the uh, South Boston Community Health Center does a phenomenal job, as do all of our community health centers. We are blessed. Uh, not only do we, I talk about this all the time, uh, we boast of some of the best hospitals in the world. We also have a network of community health centers that just provide uh, frontline care to some of our most vulnerable residents. And during COVID, I would argue that I believe it was the South Boston Community Health Center that stepped up and got right into sort of that COVID action, if you will. Uh, Council Flynn and I were able to uh, connect uh, folks in our community, particularly uh, we have a Somali community that uh, they serviced as well as the Dominican community uh, in both of our local public housing developments. And as a result of that, they were able to expand the care and support other agencies like a local nursing home that was uh, under siege at the time. So uh, hats off, not just to the commu South Boston Community Health Center, but to all of the community health centers, all the leaders, all those frontline workers that went to work every day helping uh, all of our residents. And they're in need of uh, some additional facilities and expansions, and they want to expand their programs, as do a sort of a lot of our other uh, community health centers. So I wholeheartedly support this and look forward to an expedited hearing. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Murphy, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'd like to start off by saying I am a patient at the South Boston Health Center, as is my family, and I'm also a board member on their fundraising committee. So I definitely know firsthand the great work they do and the strong role they play in that community. So not only is the South Boston Health Center the sole provider of primary and preventive care in South Boston, but it is also the first major health care provider located in the ever-expanding South Boston waterfront. Funds would help the center prepare and expand this growing population. These funds would also combat inflation, especially with medical equipment, supplies, and their food pantry, which has seen a 50% increase in the amount of food distributed since the pandemic. They have done an amazing job feeding the people in the community. And in recent news, the health center has proven that the health center successfully rises to extraordinary challenges day to day and finds safe ways to deliver care for their people. They did this especially during the pandemic. In 2021, the Massachusetts Health Quality Partners awarded South Boston Community Health Center for being one of the top practices in Massachusetts for patient experience in pediatric primary care. And in 2020, the Health Resources and Service Administration recognized them as the health center quality leader. This award is given to health centers that exemplify the best overall clinical performance among all health centers. And also, lastly, in 2020, the health center's overall clinical quality was in the top 30% of health centers nationwide. We know they're an amazing health care provider. They're also a great partner in the community and in the neighborhood. So with that being said, these funds would greatly benefit the health center and continue, <coughs> allow them to continue to deliver valuable care and services to their growing community. Thank you. Thank you, you Councillor Murphy. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Seeing no one, would anyone else like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Councillor Bach, Councillor Baker, Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Lara, Councillor Louis Jen, Councillor Mejia, uh, and please add my name. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0639? Oh, sorry, I got to refer that to a committee. Docket 0638 will be referred to the Committee on Boston's COVID 19 recovery. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0639? Docket number 0639. 
Councilors Bach and Flynn offered the following, a petition for a special law regarding an act to make certain changes in the law relative to the historic Beacon Hill District. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair now recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you to uh, Councillor Flynn um, for joining me in this. I'm going to speak on both of our behalf, but um, Councillor Flynn and I have the benefit of uh, sharing together representation of Beacon Hill. Um, and uh, we'll have more working sessions under your remit, Mr. Chair, and an opportunity to talk in greater detail, so I'll be brief. Um, basically, when the Beacon Hill Historic District extended down the North Slope in 1963, the city was poised to build the, our fire station on Cambridge Street. and. People didn't want it to interfere, and so a very narrow strip um, of the last sort of 40 feet before Cambridge Street was excluded from the district in order to not have that complication. Um, now there's the big MGH project going on up on the other side of Cambridge Street um, and concern about some of the um, historic buildings, including the Puffer Building that's mentioned here from the 1890s um, that run on the Beacon Hill brick side of Cambridge Street. So the main um, thrust of this docket, and it's come to us from the Beacon Hill Civic Association and residents in the neighborhood is just to complete that last 40 feet of the district, um, which is something that I think most people assume is already in place, but actually technically isn't. Um, so it's that and then a couple of other uh, technical um, fixes to the, to, this is a home rule petition because the Beacon Hill um, Historic District is in state statute. Um, and so the first step would be amending it here at the council and then it would have to go up to the state. Um, so just to say that this is something that uh, has been discussed for a while in, in the Beacon Hill community, and so um, folks have asked us to bring it forward, and I'm really pleased to be joining the council president in uh, bringing it forward today, so thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bach. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Uh, would uh, Add their name? I want to speak. Okay. Uh, I the speak. chair now recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Um, I think, you know, there's, what, what else can I say? There's nothing to say here except that this offer is a beacon of hope. And as long as we hope, we will never be over the hill. No, <laughs> I support. <laughs> Come on, you guys want to be relying on me. So it's, it's a tough audience. <laughs> you like All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councilor Fernandez. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Seeing no one, would anyone else like to add their name? Uh, Mr. Clerk, please add Councillor Braden, please add Councillor Coletta, please add Councillor Fernandez Anderson, please add Councillor Flaherty, please add Councillor Lara, please add Councillor Louis Jen, please add Councillor Mejia, please add Councillor Murphy, and please add my name as well. Docket 0639 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Arroyo. At this time, I'd also like to acknowledge um, a friend of the council, um, Suffolk County Sheriff, Steve Tompkins. Thank you, Steve, for being with us. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, please read dockets 0640 and 0641 together, please. Document number 0640, Councilor Braden offer the following. Order for a hearing on appropriating federal relief funds to stabilize and expand public sector personnel capacity beyond pre-pandemic levels. In docket number 0641, Councilor Braden offered the following. Order requesting certain information on the section 17F relative to the personnel review committee and personnel vacancies. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. <clears throat> the Chair recognizes Councillor Braden. Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, these are two dockets related to our personnel capacity across city departments. Uh, as we work our way through the budgeting process, we hear from uh, departments across the city about their personnel and their difficulties with um, vacancies within their departments, etc. Uh, the first docket is a hearing order on the use of ARPA funds for pandemic recovery, and the second docket is a 17F information request related to the Personnel Review Committee and Human Resources Practices for Posting and Filling Vacancies. 
For generations, public sector jobs have been a lifeline for working families in our city, providing secure employment for women and workers of colour with better benefits, greater job security and opportunities for, non -union, for union representation and full-time work. Across the country, local government public sector employment did not recover from the Great Recession of 2008 and it, uh, until 2019. Sin and then we were hit by, since the onset of the pandemic, the private sector has regained 93% of their jobs lost since 2020, while the public sector has only recovered 53% of their jobs. Looking at our city's recovery since the recession over the past 15 years, not all departments gain back their personnel full-time equivalent levels of 2008 supported by the general fund. Inspectional services has not fully reached their 2008 staffing levels, yet year after year they take on more responsibilities um, when the council and mayor pass new ordinances. And we're pretty good at that. We've added a lot of work to their, um, their workload in the last past, past few years. Public facilities and property management are staffed below 2008 levels, while our facilities, maintenance and capital projects are stalled without, without needed project managers. BCYF has more than 60 permanent full-time equivalence positions below their 2008 levels, and Public Works has 80 full-time equivalent position deficit compared to 2008 permanent staffing. All of these departments are our front lines for city services and meeting uh, residents' needs. An excerpt from the Municipal Research Bureau's 2014 transition report spells it out. Through the Great Recession of 2008, the personnel reductions of the three largest departments of school, police and fire have been less than proportional to their share of the total city employees. The greater burden experienced by the other 42 departments in the reduction of employees over 11 years is also evidenced by the fact that the police, school and fire department represents 77% of city funded payroll in 2013, but experienced 36% of the employee loss since 20, 2002. The remaining 44 departments are 22% of the workforce, but have had a 63% reduction. The US Treasury Department determined that ARPA fund relief may be used to bolster local public sector personnel capacity to restore pre-pandemic 2020 staffing levels or expand up to 7.5% beyond the pre-pandemic baseline. I hope to explore this in the, in the committee hearing. We have heard throughout the budget hearings that department after department is struggling to hire and fill vacancies. It's an incredibly competitive job market at the moment. The Position Review Committee manages the approval process for posting and filling vacancies. Since 2017, financial year 17, the City has also eliminated 190 long-term vacant positions. But we must understand why those positions were left vacant for so long, what functions they served, were they essential, and are they con currently being contracted out? The 17F order is intended to provide this, the Council insight into the personnel processes in the context of fiscal management and recovery policies over the span of multiple mayoral administrations going back to uh, 2008 not just what is from in front of us right now. And in, and, in, and in this moment, we have a responsibility to look at the human resources situation holistically and use any and all tools at our disposal to help recruit and retain personnel for our city workforce so that we can continue to sustain, sustain and deliver good quality um, constituent services across all departments and unleash the power of municipal government. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Um, on, on docket 0640, would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The Chair recognizes Councillor Bach. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and thank you uh, to Councillor Braden for filing this, and please add my name. Um, I, I think it's been the most frustrating thing 
for I think many of us about budget season, um, but for those of us who were here last year, the number of things where we approved new positions last year and they haven't been filled because of this hiring situation. I mean, if you think about like YEE, which we had up, we, we had approved them for four new people and said they lost people. With the speed humps, we had approved a whole second team so we could parallel process. Instead, Public Works is down to one engineer. Um, I was walking with property management around graffiti busters yesterday and they've got to like a third of the team vacant. So I just think like again and again, this council is seeing the limitations of like the appropriation power is nice, but if we don't have the staff in place, then the money doesn't move and the work isn't done on behalf of the residents of the city. And so I, I've appreciated the administration's references to their plan to kind of do comp and class analysis and try to raise, um, you know, salaries appropriately to be competitive. But I just think this is a critical issue and it's becoming critical in every department. And so really appreciate Councilor Braden bringing it forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Buck. The Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Councilor Rena. Even though I wasn't um, here for the hearing, I did hear that um, a line item that we fought for and approved last year, which was uh, workforce development for 19 to 24 year olds, that a position um, wasn't filled. And as a result of that, that um, that line item has yet to be tapped, right? So when we fight for things on the council um, to serve our constituents and then we don't have the personnel to do the work, it impacts all of us. And so I really do appreciate you bringing this hearing um, and this request to the council and I look forward to the conversation. Please add my name, thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker. Thank you, Mr. Support. President. Um, being someone that was laid off during that I was laid off in 2010, print department, people know about it, still would never be able to figure out how much we're spending in the city on printing. That department had to go away with, um, but what I wanted to focus on was what Kenzie had spoke about. It's the people that are doing the work. If you look in the policy rooms, they're all full. All the nerds are all clicking away on their computers. All the policy rooms are filled, but the people that are doing the work, that are filling the potholes, that are mowing our grass, that are, we don't have them there. We need to focus on that, the people that are actually doing the work, our constituent service sort of stuff. So just wanted to add my two cents. Thank you, and please add my name. Thank you. To both dockets. Yeah, thank you, Council Baker. Anyone else looking to speak on the matter? The chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. I rise in uh, support to my uh, council colleague, um, and to quote my Angelo, still I rise. Uh, that's the last one, I promise. I promise. <laughs> so I think this idea is genius. Um, and speaking of nerds, thanks, Wayne. Now we got a lot of work to do. Um, I wholeheartedly support this. I think it's brilliant. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Um, anyone else like? Would you like to add your name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Council Arroyo, Council Baker, Council Bach. Councilor Braden, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Fernandez, Anderson, Councilor Lara, Councilor Lujan, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy. Please add the chair. Docket 0640 be assigned to the committee on Boston's COVID-19 recovery. Councilor Braden also seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0641. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0641 has been passed. Um, we're on to docket 0642. Mr. Clerk, please read that docket. Docket number 0642, Councilor Mejia offer the following. Order for a hearing on government accountability, transparency, and accessibility of decision-making protocols in city government. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. And I'd like to add Councilor Tanya Fernandez Anderson as an original co sponsor. Councilor Fernandez Anderson is so, at, so ordered. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, if you've heard of me speak before, you know that you've heard me say nothing about us without us is for us. Um, and it's something that I said a lot when I was first running for office. And it, and it was meant to remind people that we can't let the people who um, are in power close the door on us when it comes to the decisions and choices that they make every day that impact our daily lives and lived experiences. 
I thought as a city councilor that I'd be able to get in here and learn the, the decision-making protocols and bringing that knowledge to the people. But even now, as a counselor, I struggle to grapple with how decisions are being made. And I'm often notified that something in the administration is happening after it has occurred. Cabinet appointments, department hires are made without consulting us. COVID ARPA dollars are being spent with little community interaction. CBA decisions are being made in opposition to popular support for certain projects. And in one study conducted in collaboration with our office, we found that ne nearly a quarter a quarter of respondents said that they strongly disagree that their voice was heard and represented in policy decisions. This is a problem, but it's not a problem that's unique to one mayor or one city council or one department. We have systems and structures in place in our cities that predate all of us, that determine how we make decisions and how we must collaborate in order to make those decisions. But those systems routinely leave the voices of the people out. And so that is why we're filing this hearing today. We need to get to the bottom of how decisions are being made here in the city of Boston, what systems and structures are in place that force us to make decisions that way, and what structural changes or even changes to the charter need to be made in order to ensure that the voices of the people, and that's all people, are being heard. I look forward to this conversation and learning more alongside my colleagues. I um, really do appreciate um, my favorite nerd um, in the policy making space, uh, Jacob DeBlaycourt, for his relentless advocacy um, in getting us to, to this point. I really do believe if we're really serious about changing the way we do business, that's gonna um, require us to look at how we are functioning. Um, I know that I have been incredibly disappointed by the number of things that have come across this council and I've been forced to vote yes or no on things that I haven't had much of a voice in. And I have a responsibility to my constituents to making sure that we're creating the, the type of structure that allows us for us to really uh, uh, represent them and their voices. So I look forward to the hearing um, and my colleagues to participating. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Councilor. Uh, President Flynn and uh, the, my original co-sponsor, uh, Councillor Mejia, thank you so much for um, partnering or adding me to your, um, uh, yeah, that. Um, the, so the councilor, so the council needs access um, to all relevant information eminent from the city government, right? And the issue here, I think, is that if there's no, if there's not a one streamlined process, then things are, can get you know, sort of um, contrived or we lose trust in this paranoia. And we talk about this, these processes that include us. We talk about, I've heard my council colleagues talk about equity and being um, what being that we know that certain thing or certain monies affect a certain population and pulling on our heartstrings, beautiful presentations. and. All of that should be followed with good intentions and, of course, implementation of action. Um, however, if we're not working on a transparent platform, if we're not, if we're not doing that together, as, as uh, my council colleague, uh, Sister Mejia, said, if, it doesn't, if it's not with us, then it's not for us. Um, so I strongly, of course, um, agree and support this and look forward to the work. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak or, or sign on to the, this matter? Please raise your hand. <clears throat> Mr. Quirk, please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Braden, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, um, Council Flaherty, Council Lara, Council Eugen, Council Murphy. Please add the chair. Docket 0642 will be assigned to the Committee on Government Accountability, Transparency, and <coughs> Accessibility. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0643. Docket number 0643, Councilor Mejia offered the following. Resolution opposing state receivership for Boston Public Schools. The Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd also like to add Councillor Arroyo as an original co-sponsor, as well as Councillor Louis Jean. 
Seeing no objection, Council Royal and Council Jenna so ordered. So last month, the Committee on Education held a hearing on docket 0199 in order for a hearing on state receivership for Boston Public Schools. As you all may remember, I tried to pass this resolution on the floor and I was encouraged by my colleagues that we needed a hearing and we did just that. The goal of the hearing was to educate the public and the council around what receivership is and how it impacts our school communities. The hearing was insightful because we heard time and time again from the administration, advocates, family members, students, and members of the community that receivership is wrong, is the wrong move for BPS. State receivership is wrong, is the wrong move for Boston for many reasons, not least of which is that DESE has a miserable track record of improving schools it has taken into receivership. Bessie has voted to place three districts in receivership, Lawrence in 2021, Holyoke in 2015, which I opposed back then as a parent advocate, and Southbridge in 2016. Southbridge and Holyoke are now the worst performing and second worst performing school districts in the state, according to DESE's most district ranking. Following an initial uptick, Lawrence has been on the decline and is now back on the lowest of 6% of districts. A Boston Globe analysis of test scores, graduation rates, college enrollment, and a dozen of other metrics, Lawrence, Holyoke, and Southbridge published on Sunday show that the state has failed to meet almost all of its stated goals for the district. BPS is not without his problems, and we all know that because we sit in these budget hearings every day. But these are problems that can be solved by turning to the community, not by initiating yet another executive leadership re retooling. That kind of thinking lacks innovation and intentionally avoids the core problems a um, BPS is facing. You can swap out the players at the top all you want, but the instability created through that process trickles down to parents, students, and teachers, and we're left exactly where we started only less engaged and, le and less hopeful for the future. This resolution has been a, in a long time coming. We filed it back in 2021, and there was a desire from the council to learn more about the receivership, which we did, which includes our school community. We followed through on that request and created space for community members and counselors to come forward and learn more. <coughs> Since then, there have been several op articles, op-eds, personal testimonies on social media, from people across the district ur urging the city to fight back against any threat of receivership. Receivership is opposed by members of this body and has received opposition from the mayor, even Harin Hertunau, who was a former DESE board member and came out and said that her vote to place Lawrence under receivership was the wrong choice. It simply does not work when, when if we can't risk doing further damage to our school district by handling, by handling over it um, to the board with no clear um, track record for improvement. It is time that we, as the Boston City Council and the representatives of the people, listen to their voice and join them in opposing any threat of state receivership for Boston Public Schools. And I move, and I move that we suspend the rules and urge my colleagues to vote in favor of this resolution. I will say, you know, everything is always political um, theatrics, and you know, we have an opportunity here as a council to hold the district accountable, um, and it is our, um, I would say it is in our best interest to make sure that we support um, this resolution because it gives us the ability to hold the district more accountable instead of allowing outsiders to tell us what is right for our people. So I encourage our colleagues to rise up and um, vote in favor of this resolution today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Council President uh, Flynn, and thank you, uh, Councilor Mejia, for your leadership. Uh, I voice uh, my strongest opposition to uh, taking our Boston Public Schools into receivership. Uh, I'm very aware of Desi's track record. I think the Boston Globe recently published uh, that record, but we've heard it from advocates and we've seen it on the ground. They have not done uh, really any commendable work in their turnarounds to date in smaller school districts. Uh, at the very beginning of my career, I worked in Lawrence, uh, and so I commuted from Boston to Lawrence, and I got to see firsthand what that takeover did to that community. 
uh, and the parents uh, and the lack of parent engagement and the way in which that community has been fighting since to take back control of their schools so that they can have a voice in the decisions that are being made with their children. Uh, and as uh, Councilor Mejia has noted, the academic improvements uh, have really gone down. Uh, and that initial uptick, frankly, uh, came from uh, injection of resources, a, a small injection of resources into the actual facilities. If you actually saw the Lawrence facilities, uh, they had put a lot of money into improving them and making them modern and standard. But now, as we sit here today, we've seen repeatedly that DESI does not have the ability or the resources or, frankly, the skill level to come in and take these schools over. Uh, and so I am voicing my strongest opposition to receivership. I do believe that this is something that we can handle uh, with Boston Public Schools. I, I do know that there are places where, frankly, we would like to see uh, them do better, but I know adamantly that the state receivership is not a solution to those things uh, and that those are the kinds of things that we have better control of, frankly, as a body here with parents' engagement with a school committee and with a superintendent. I know that uh, Councilor Pre Council President Flynn has sort of raised up the specter of what receivership is doing to our current efforts to improve uh, by selecting and hiring a new superintendent. And I think the fact of the matter is having this over our Boston Public Schools heads is actually stopping us from getting and moving forward in a way that is productive. And so I would like to see this, this pursuit ended, uh, or at least the conversation around it ended, because we know that they don't have the ability to really do this well. Uh, and so uh, with that, I add my voice to this, uh, and I hope to see this pass today. Thank you. The chair, thank you, Council Royal. The chair recognizes Council Lujan. Council Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, um, and thank you to Council Mejia for this um, resolution. I also rise in very uh, strong opposition to any notion that there should be any state intervention into our schools for a lot of the reasons that have been said. Um, there's no track record of success. Um, we are in a pivotal moment as a city with a largely new city council, a new mayor with a new vision for our schools. Uh, a lot of change, we're hiring a new superintendent. So for this to be thrown in as a distraction is unnecessary. Um, and I also just, I'm cautious that the state, we should always be cautious when the state is taking its cues from a free market th think tank that really doesn't believe in the public good, right? We're talking about what we need in our public schools, and that's deeper investment to make up for a lot of intentional policy failures and policy harms that have been done towards our schools. So I think you know that the state is taking cues from a think tank that believes that the model should always be privatization, should be everything that we need to know about why this is not the right approach for our schools and for our students. I was with a a teacher just last evening uh, from the Dever School, and the Dever um, has been in receivership uh, since 2014 with almost nothing to show for that. And so I think um, we have the tools that we need here uh, to really help transform our schools. Um, the state does not. And so I am in strong support of this uh, resolution, and I, I, I um, am glad that it was filed. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lujan. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Mm -hmm. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and obviously thank you to our colleagues, Council Mejia and the co-sponsors, and I appreciate uh, the spirit uh, by which this is filed. I understand legitimate concerns about total state receivership, and I do not support total state receivership. Uh, with that said, I will not be signing onto the resolution, but will not stand in the way pursuant to Rule 33 to allow the motion to be adopted. I, I just want to be perfectly clear that for me, uh, this has nothing to do with our teachers, our beloved BTU, uh, our students, or the countless individuals uh, who work hard every day on behalf of our students. For me, it has to do with the systemic failures of our central office and their proven inability to consistently support our schools, our teachers, and our school communities. Our school district is consistently failing our most vulnerable students and violating the law, particularly as it pertains to our English language learners and our special education students. For our students that require IEPs, there are many cases where students do not have adequate accommodations or plans in place. For our English language learners, there are documented failures to provide students with equitable access to ELL teachers and appropriate support. 
We also have significant operational issues, whether it's our transportation system, our data reporting system, our facilities, our safety policies, or mechanisms consistently tracking parental and community concerns. We don't have one. We don't have a system that tracks parental community concerns, despite the fact that we're talking about uh, all the investments that we've made over the last several years. Look no further than this past January. 16,000 kids, 16,000 kids were left stranded, didn't get picked up. That's never happened. I'm here almost 20 years. It's, I've never seen it this bad. You all know I have been a fierce advocate for public education. I've fought to support all of the critical investments in our district. I believe in those investments and I will continue to support them. I also believe that it may be time to talk about a strategic partnership or targeted interventions may be appropriate, whether that's with the state or frankly, the federal government. If anyone here doesn't think that the Department of Justice is looking at this very issue, you are sadly mistaken. And I would rather come to the table and identify those three, four, five areas and partner or have targeted interventions with the state or the federal government as opposed to having them come in and taking the whole thing over. Which again, as I referenced in the beginning of this, I do not support that. I think targeted partnerships in these areas where we've failed to consistently make progress, year in, year out, year in, year out, same old, same old, all we continue to do is creep increasing the budget, we continue to give them more money, we're actually educating less kids than we've ever educated in the city, 7,000 less in the last couple of years, and I just think that the time has come to call it what it is, which is we need to call out the central office. It's not about calling out our teachers, it's not about the students. There are dedicated professionals, passionate, committed to our children, to making a difference in their lives, to closing those gaps. It has nothing to do with them. For me, this is about the central office. The buck stops with the superintendent and the central office. They are thwarting progress. They are getting in the way of good instruction, good support. And for me, I just think that the time has come that we call them out. And whether it's a targeted intervention or it's a strategic partnership, I think now is the time between now and Tuesday to negotiate what that is. I understand it's a difficult time because we're trying to attract a new superintendent. This probably is, a, the timing on this is horrendous. I know that we've got 31 applicants. I believe in the mayor and her plan and her vision to turn the schools around. I wanna work with the new superintendent allow him or her to get their legs underneath them to move forward. This may be an opportunity for them as well. We potentially could make an argument that if we allow those three or four critical areas where we've chronically uh, and systemically underperformed, maybe we could negotiate that our new superintendent can be the receiver. What do, they, what do they think about that idea? And so these are the things that I'm sort of thinking about. So again, I appreciate the efforts of our colleagues, the lead sponsor, her work on the Education Committee and the hearing that she hosted. Uh, and again, as I referenced, I wanted to state my objection for the record, uh, and again, state that it has nothing to do with our teachers. This is all about the central office and calling them out. And as I mentioned, Mr. President, uh, I will not uh, stand in the way with Rule 33. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. The Chair recognizes Council Fernandez-Anderson. Council Fernandez-Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I strongly support my colleague's offer. A receivership has been shown to actually not improve um, quality of schools in the districts um, that have utilized that approach. Um, and local districts that have gone under receivership are much smaller than Boston. Um, and then in that process, um, ineffective for them. So that begs the question, like, if this policy cannot work on small district, then why would it work on a district as big or the biggest district in the state? Um, additionally, receivership is often used to counteract school districts that are struggling for um, a number of socioeconomic reasons that often transcend to school themselves. Um, in short, our students need food, housing, language supports, and mental health counseling and so forth. So how does putting the schools that they attend in receivership into receivership help them actually get the resources and uh, services that they need. Um, the state is 
really far removed from our youth. They don't see our youth as individuals. They don't know our youth. Um, and so because of this, I heartily endorse this offer from Councilor Mejia and oppose VPS schools being placed under receivership. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, <clears throat> This resolution defends and protects the status quo for a system that can't even keep our students, teachers, and staff safe. Graduation rates and, and, and academic prog progress is astoundingly poor. So we want to double down on a system that's failing our children and our families in a city where enrollment plummets alongside morale. We need fundamental change, and this resolution does the opposite. It's time for the city council to illuminate the facts of what's going on in our schools, not to cover up the misdeeds and failures we're pretending as if status quo is okay, because it's not. Let's get a range of people in here and have a hearing. Let's get Desi in here. Let's not have the echo chamber that we're used to. Everybody's saying we don't want, we don't want receivership. Let's get some opposing views. The single-sided, um, the single-sided, Hearings don't work. It needs to be two, two different opposing views there, which we are not providing here in this chamber. I agree with Council Flaherty with the, with the targeted interventions. Doesn't need to be a total takeover. Wildly unsafe. Kids aren't able to read. Buildings failing. Spending, I think it's 160 million this year on transportation. Will be another 10 million next year. Another 10 million after that. We spend 40 to 50 million every year, three times what the police budget is. We're looking to defund the police, but we're looking to double down on something that's failing. I just don't get it. I don't understand it. And you're either, now it's going to be either receivership or not. There's some place in the middle there, which I think Council Flaherty spoke to pretty well. So, and that's where I am. Do I want the state to come in and take over? No, but I think there's definitely areas where we can be, be improved. And, you know as well as I know that safety is one of them. If we don't have safety in our schools, just like if we don't have safety on our streets, if we don't have safety in our transportation systems, we can kiss it all goodbye. The schools are unsafe right now. That's a huge problem. Kids aren't able to read. That's a huge problem. So that's my two cents. I will be voting no on this. And again, I won't block it if other people don't don't want to, but I think it, it warrants another hearing, a balanced hearing, if we're able to, to do a balanced hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Council Baker. The chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, first, I want to say that I am in support of this resolution, and I am against um, Massachusetts State Receivership for BPS. I attended the hearing that was um, chaired by Councillor Mejia, and I think it really did a good job at illuminating all of the issues um, that state receivership would cause for our um, school district. Um, I was only gonna vote in support and was not gonna rise to speak, but after the show of political theater from my colleagues, I think that it's incredibly important that we um, really have an honest conversation about what we're talking about here. First, Desi did not show up to the hearing after they were invited. So if, through the chair, if my colleague, Councillor Baker, has any connections to get them to come and speak up for themselves, then we would love to have them there. Secondly, Boston Public Schools and DESE have been under a memorandum of understanding that outlined what BPS would do to improve the issue areas that DESE identified and what DESE would do to support BPS to meet those areas. Boston Public Schools showed up, talked about all of the work that they have been doing on their side of the memorandum of understanding, Desi did not show up, and to my knowledge and everybody that was there to testify could not prove that they had met any of the commitments that they made on the MOU to BPS. Not only that, they sped up the review process. So they didn't even give BPS the necessary time to really reflect back on, um, on the review process and the promises that were made in the MOU, which included supporting all of the issues that were outlined by Councilman Ferrari and BPS, and DESE has done nothing. So even during the process of the MOU with BPS and DESE, they have been completely unable to provide not only results, but any kind of support to BPS. 
Does, do Boston Public Schools have issues? Yes, absolutely. And we should be able to talk about those issues earnestly and we should be able to talk about those issues collectively. But it's absolutely no surprise that the State Department wants to come in here when the people of the city of Boston just voted to move to an elected school committee, when we have a mayor that is committed to hiring a superintendent that's really gonna transform our schools. We're moving towards more democratic governance. We're moving towards a different vision for BPS. And now the state wants to come in and try to take over. This is an affront to the voters of the city. It's a slap in the face to the parents who have worked so hard to make sure that they can have a voice in the schooling and what happens in the schools where their students are attending. So the voters are gonna tell us that they want one thing and we're gonna stand up here and say that we care about students and we care about teachers, but we're gonna tell the voters where they can shove it and that we're gonna support the State Department to come in here and tell us what we need to be doing with our schools when the voters of this city has told, have told us the opposite. You wanna talk about having balanced hearings? The people of this city elected every single one of the counselors that are standing around here. So the people of the city have decided what voice they want here in the city council chambers. And every single one of us here is representing what the voters have asked us to come and represent. So we can do one or two things. We can have an honest conversation about BPS. We can file the resolution. We can say that, yes, we have problems and we wanna have an opportunity to fix those issues ourselves. We all just got here. The mayor just got here. We have so many problems to fix and we need to be given an opportunity to fix those issues. So we can either say, give us a chance to do right by our families, or we can say, no, let's let a failed model come into our city and see if we can roll the dice on our children's education and roll the dice on what the voters of the city have already told us that they want. I, I, I appreciate the fire that I've seen from my colleagues, I get it. You gotta stand up. There are people that want them to say what they need to say. But at some point, we have to make decisions as the city council of one of the largest 25 cities in this country that are based on fact and that are based on data and not just political rhetoric. And that is why I'm in support of this resolution and I'll be voting yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Lara. The chair recognizes Council Murphy. Council Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. So, as the only educator on this body, someone who has dedicated my entire career to teaching and nurturing the children of Boston, I am standing up today to say, this is devastating. I was a student in BPS in 1974. I put my son on a bus in 1992. I've been in the system as a mother. I've been in the system as a student and also as a teacher for over 20 years. Yes, the state and DESE has a really bad track record, but Boston Public Schools has not shown us much better year after year, decade after decade. Transportation, food services, even basic services like getting our children to school, feeding our children, never mind that so many special education students and EL students, which I was both a teacher of, do not get the proper services they need. So yes, the state will come in. Yes, the federal government will probably come in. But I'm just standing today to say I'm not standing up because there are voters out there or constituents who want me to say something. I'm standing up to say, when asked where do I stand on receivership, I will always unapologetically say, I stand on the side of the children. We have failed them, and it breaks my heart. I've seen it as a mother who's had to pull her kids out of underperforming schools. I've seen it as a neighbor who listens to parents. It, it burns me that we spend so much money and so many families feel that you either get into a school and that's considered a goal, you know, you get the golden ticket. Every child in the city of Boston deserves to get a seat at a quality school. Every child in the city of Boston deserves to get that golden ticket, not just a few of our families. I also stand in support of our teachers. The teachers I know, I was one of them for 24 years and I have been touring schools since I got here on the other side now as a city councilor. And yes, you will see amazing things. I was blown away by the play at the Warren Prescott. I was at the Elliott this morning. I was at East Boston High last week. Go to any school at any moment and you will see amazing things happening, that is true. 
but something has to change. And I don't know what the answer is. Is it receivership or not? But it absolutely has to change. We can't just keep throwing money at a system that is not showing up for our children. So I believe we need to stand together and just fight for our children. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. The chair recognizes Councilor Bork. Councilor Bork, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. And um, similarly to Councilor Lara, I wasn't going to speak today, um, but I just I wanted to uh, state my support for the resolution. I think that the it is true that we are facing deep challenges in BPS, but the problem is is that every one of them are things that take deep collaborative partnership work. I mean, when you talk about literacy, like we we have to do like deep literacy curriculum rollout across the district like that's something that like it it takes kind of that like line level time it isn't something that gets better by people's like pounding their fists on the table and it's i can't see it getting better through the sort of state city theatrics um and the same thing you know when you think about rolling out pre-k when you think about reforming special ed like i think the thing this district needs is an empowered superintendent who is backed by both the mayor and the council to do things that take time, that take longer than one news cycle to like actually really dig in. And I think that a path towards receivership is a path into further news cycle governing of the BPS system. And I can't see that um, as an as a educator on the, on the college side. Like when I think about what makes good curriculum, when I think about like what really changes like students' experience, I just, I can't see it coming through state receivership. And as a number of colleagues have said, there's pretty strong evidence that state receivership is not delivering those results for any school district. So I do think, like, I, I value colleagues' point that, like, there's a lot of places that where we have to say as a body where BPS has been and is now is not acceptable. Um, but I think when I think about the kind of, like, slow and complicated and really committed work that we need to be doing. It's work that we need to be doing as a city with partners. And I think that the state can bring resources to the table and, and private entities can bring resources to the table. Everybody can throw an oar in, but, but that doesn't require something like receivership. So I, I just, I really feel strongly that this is something where we need a great superintendent and the mayor and the council need to back them. And it is gonna take leadership from everyone at the city, um, but I, I I don't think Desi has the capacity to help through a receivership lens, um, and I think that it would set us back considerably, and I agree, I think it was Councilor Lujan, um, but it might have been Councilor Mejia who said that in a lot of ways, the fact that what, what we're fighting about is receivership today is a distraction from a lot of the like core issues that we need to be focused on. So I just wanted to say, um, please add my name and I'll be supporting the resolution. Thank you, Council Bob. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and really do appreciate all of my colleagues who rose up to speak in regards to this issue. Um, I'll just say that I was appointed by DESE to be on their accountability task force. And while I was there, I was there to serve the parent voice, and I was one of very few people of color in that space. And the way that DESE normally measures accountability is by giving themselves a pass in terms of the things that they were supposed to rise up and do. So I really do appreciate Councilor Lada calling that out because I saw it for myself firsthand as someone who was appointed um, to one of their committees. I also think that it's really important for us to acknowledge that um, as a council, we are also held responsible. Um, we approve the Boston Public Schools budget every year. So we can't talk about accountability without seeing the role that we have played, particularly my council colleague, Flaherty, who's not here to hear this, but I'm sure he'll watch the tape and rewind, that you've been on this council for 20 years. And year after year, we keep having the same conversation and not much changes. And so if we're really serious about leaning into this work, we also need to uh, call ourselves into this process and recognize that in many ways the council has failed the Boston Public Schools as well. And so this is a call for us to recognize the role that we have played or not in this process. And while I do appreciate my colleagues, um, uh, you know, comments around the children, I'm a Boston Public School graduate and a Boston Public School parent who worked in the Boston Public School space. 
And so for me, this is really about an opportunity for us to finally do right by the parents and the students and the educators and bringing someone else from the outside, especially in Boston, since we're always so worried about outsiders. If we're really worried about outsiders, that's what we're doing right now, is allowing outsiders to come into our city and telling us how we should be. So in the interest of protecting our Boston public schools, um, I'm going to ask my colleagues to vote in favor of this resolution. Um, and look forward to continuing the work and holding all of ourselves accountable to ensure that um, accountability is 360, and that includes us. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Mr. Quirk. Uh, please add Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Lara, Councilor Murphy. Please add the chair. Councilor Mejia, Councilor Royal, Councilor Lujan. Seek suspension of the rules and adoption of 0643. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Nay. Doubt the vote. Mr. Clerk, could you please call a uh, roll call vote? Roll call vote on docket number 0643, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker? Nay. Councilor Baker, no. Councilor Bach? Aye. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden? Aye. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Coletta? Aye. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty? Councilor Flynn? Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara. Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Lu Yes. Councilor Lu yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. Resolution has passed. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The resolution, um, the resolution has passed. Um, Mr. Clerk, we're going on to docket 0644. Docket number 0644, Councilor Fernandez Anderson offered the following. Resolution to name the District 7 Art Corridor the Artery. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The Chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. <sighs> it's about time I file something else. <laughs> um, all jokes aside, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, and I just wanted to share a little bit about my art experience. And we're going to go really quick through this because I know I talk a lot. Um, so my experience with the arts, I just wanted to share a little bit with you guys to let you know that if you don't, haven't noticed, darlings, I belong in theater. Um, so my, my experience with the art is that I actually uh, owned a theater company. And I would, I'm a playwright. I would direct and produce and playwright and also design and sew my own costumes. Carrie, it's not working. Oh, OK, there we go. Um, and so I would uh, put on like uh, all of these fascinating shows. We would do, we would activate spaces and do, um, we did a float called um, Wakanda Fest in the Caribbean Carnival. And it was all of the African diaspora children returning to Wakanda to unite in one utopia. Anyway, so look at these babies. Can you imagine I sewed and designed every single piece and I would curate and um, direct uh, the plays. Um, and so we did a show at WBUR. Uh, really quick, thank you. Shout out to my sister uh, colleague, Lara, for mentioning that, um, or re being a uh, research nerd. Anyway, she's told me that um, WBUR has a newsletter called The Ottery. We looked it up, it's not trademark, it's a newsletter. Um, and so there's a bunch of otteries, and I guess my, origin, my uh, name is not that original, but whatever, it's not registered in Boston, so we're taking it. All right, so we would also activate spaces. We would do like runway on the streets. Um, we did a lot of like shows, like, you know, we would just go like national and do all of these shows. We did something where uh, Dracula was like crazy, but he time traveled through time and 
these are just different costumes, different shows. We would do like fashion runways in the train stations. If we, uh, we would do stuff like in construction sites, anything to activate space and show art and create platforms for black and brown artists. Um, here we did a silent, I did a silent play uh, where you would actually read the prompt in the background, um, Dracula there with Mina and all the, all the aunties in the theater would ooh and ah when he you know, ripped off his shirt or whatever. But um, this is me in front having fun with my beautiful models and team and uh, these are all of my beautiful work. Um, and then I also did a thing where, a show where we would highlight uh, women of all influences, meaning uh, LGBTQ plus community um, in, express, in self expression in different times and cultures. Um, and as you can see, that, that's actually Aline Mercury, if you guys can't recognize her. She's a choreographer in partnership with all of the arts that we've um, done in the Strand Theater as well. And we became the most well attended, the best attended show in the Strand Theater in the last uh, four years or so pre COVID. Um, and I don't know if you guys know Taylor, but she would host every year. And there's me barefoot after an exhausting show. Um, we would do that for several years. I also owned a boutique, so obviously this is where I got to do all my work. Now, back to the Ottery. This is an opportunity for us to activate space, empty lots, and do pop-ups, and uh, also placemaking and placekeeping. We are looking forward to go from Mass Ave, Columbus Ave, Mass Ave and Columbus, Columbus, to all the way to Grove Hall, and we want to name it the Ottery because when we create identity, then we can actually begin to build this capital project, uh, whereas we would look at uh, storefronts and remove the crates, put them on the inside, reface them, uh, activate arts, get beautiful bins. Remember how, you guys know how I always complain, we want Roxbury to look like South End, that thing, yeah. Well, we would beautify the entire strip and repave the street. And this is all in collaboration with the mayor and we're getting ready to announce it. So it's gonna be, um, I, I welcome all of you to come and you know, cut the ribbon with us and have fun. Uh, Black Market, you guys saw there, Black Market um, has some murals on the ground and Pro Black, um, a dear friend of mine who I grew up with and worked with, um, d does a lot of these murals all over the place. So we want to extend that and truly uh, be more intentional about how we put them on a storefront as well as you know, uh, buildings all throughout the corridor. This, of course, I don't have to explain to you guys how it revitalizes business districts. It brings, uh, connects to tourist attraction. We can bring Duck Tour down to Roxbury, to the hood. And um, yeah, and boost economic, uh, some of economic mobility in D7. So I ask you to please uh, suspend and pass and uh, support uh, the naming of the Art Corridor, District 7 Art Corridor as the Ottery. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Um, Council Fernandez Anderson seeks suspension of the rules. Oh, oh, yeah. Would anyone like to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name in this matter? Please raise your hand, Mr. Clerk. Please add Council Arroyo, Council of Bach, Council of Braden, Council of Coletta, Council of Lujan, Council of Mejia, Council of Murphy. Please add the chair. Council of Fernandez Anderson seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of 0644. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. Yay. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, please read Thank docket. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please read docket 0645. Docket you number. love me. You really love me. Docket number 0645. Councilor Murphy offered the following. Resolution recognizing the contributions of African-American military veterans and recognize African-American Military Heritage Month. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I'd like to suspend the rules and add Councilor Anderson and President Flynn, please. Seeing no objection, uh, Councilor Fernandez-Anderson and the chair are so ordered. Thank, Thank you, Councilor Murphy. 
You so, thank you. So I want to thank Commissioner Santiago from Boston Veteran Services and Mr. Fennell, who are here in the audience. And um, thank you, Mr. Fennell, for your sacrifice and commitment and service during the Vietnam War and in Okinawa. And thank you also for your continued community service in your educational endeavors as a poet and founder of the o Oscar Michelle Family Theater Program. So thank you for that. And um, I stand to offer this resolution today to recognize Saturday, May 21st, 2022, as African American Military Heritage Day. Each year at the General Edward O. Gordon Veterans Memorial Park, the organization of Afro-American veterans and other military veteran organizations gather to memorialize the history and contributions of African American military veterans. Here they honor African American military and civil service by conversating with one another and sharing their experiences. In general, 43% of the 1.3 million men and women on active duty in the United States military are people of color. Yet only two of the 41 most senior commanders in the military are black. Most, more specifically, in 2020, black soldiers compromised approximately 21% of active duty Army, 15% of the Army National Guard, and 21% of the Army Reserve. It should be noted that black Americans serve in the um, Army at a higher rate than their representation rate in the yeah. U.S. population, which is 13.4. So the purpose of annually celebrating African Military Heritage Day in Boston is to recognize and commemorate the service of African American veterans in every war. The history will not be forgotten, and I'm happy to say that Veterans Memorial Park in Roxbury plays a part in this commemoration. With that said, Boston will continue to support the United States African American military and veterans to show that our city strongly embraces diversity to create a system that maximizes individual talents and increases morale, regardless of race, color, or gender. So in short, I ask that my colleagues on the Boston Council pass this resolution to acknowledge Saturday, May 21st, 2022, as African American Military Heritage Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Councilor uh, Flynn, Council President Flynn. Uh, thank you, Councillor Murphy, for offering this resolution to recognize the African-American military veterans who have served in the U.S. Armed Forces throughout this nation's history. Uh, they have served despite often being the victims of blatant racism and discrimination. During Civil War, they fought to help free their uh, enslaved brethren and themselves. Um, during World War I, they served bravely only to come back to this country to be lynched and beaten, often in uniform immediately after the war. Uh, during World War II, they fought courageously to defeat fascism while continuing to be victimized by Jim Crow and legalized segregation at home. The Army itself was not segregated until 1950, meaning that in all the wars I've described above, the black soldiers were in separate fighting units, often led by segregationist commanders. During the Vietnam War, while black people were rising up for their freedom in this country, many others were drafted into or chose to serve in the army. They fought bravely, even if they weren't always in full agreement with the objectives, or if their main goals was to come home in one piece. And so it goes, so the present day, uh, where black men and women continue to serve our country via their service in the military, one of them being my son, um, Luis Miguel, uh, let me just say, Luis Miguel Freire uh, Roca, who is um, a Marine, uh, who I am extremely proud of, who, um, induces anxiety every time I talk of him uh, because he is so dear and near to my heart. I'm extremely proud of him. This young man is so beautiful, in and out. Um, not because I'm his mother, obviously. 
Um, but I am so extremely proud of my son for making his own decision, for being someone who wants to serve his country. And I am just, I, I can't say um, how, how happy I am that he has made, taken his own path to serve our country and how much I love him for it. And I pray for his protection and guidance, guidance always, amen. So uh, thanks again to my colleagues and for offering this resolution. Um, and I'm gladly to the second it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. I would like to echo the comments of Councilor Fernandez Anderson and Councilor Murphy. Exceptional heroism of African American men and women in their role is part of the U.S. military. They fought bravely. They fought under very difficult conditions. They came back to the states and weren't treated with the respect and dignity that they've earned. I've had a good friend, Willis Saunders, Willis Saunders who's passed away. He's an older gentleman. He was a Tuskegee Airman, superintendent of Boston Police. Um, and I heard him tell stories about the incredible sacrifices and contributions of African-American men and women in the milita military to our country. So just want to say thank you to my, my colleagues, but the entire body for, for supporting African-American veterans. I'd also like to thank my friend, who's the Commissioner of Veterans Services, Rob Santiago, for always being there in support of African-American veterans and making sure that um, they have the services and um, programs that they've earned. So thank you, Commissioner Santiago. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Or would anyone else like? The chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I just wanted to rise to extend my gratitude and thanks um, to the veterans that are here with us today. I think it's incredibly honorable to fight for your country when so many times we have failed to fight for them in the same way. Um, I am excited to support this resolution in honor of black veterans, in honor of the black veteran war tax resistors, in honor of the black veteran Vietnam war veterans and the people, the black veterans who fought against the war here and abroad. And on behalf of my best friend, Kalia Goodwin, who is a Navy veteran herself. So I wanted to say thank you to you. I'm very happy to support this, this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. Would anyone like to sign on? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Lara, Councilor Eugene, Councilor Mejia. Councilor Murphy, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, in Flynn seek suspension of the rules and passage. <coughs> In adoption of docket 0645, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. We're on to late files. I am informed by the clerk that there are, th there are two late file matters. Are there three, three late file matters? Okay. Um, a hearing order from Councilor Buck, a personnel order. Oh, yeah, in a, in a letter from Council Wuerl. Um, let me go to um, the hearing order for Council Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Mr. Clerk, please read the um, docket into the record. Okay. Okay. So the late files should be on everyone's desk. We'll take a vote to add these three into the agenda. As I mentioned, the hearing order from Councilor Bach, a personnel order in a letter from Council, Councilor Worrell. Uh, we will take a vote to add these items into the agenda. All those in favor of adding the late file matters into the agenda, please say aye. 
the ayes have it. Thank you. The late file matters have been added to the agenda. <coughs> Mr. Clerk, please read the first late file matter. Uh, letter from uh, City Councilor Brian Worrell. Dear Council colleagues, I re regretfully cannot attend today's City Council meeting. I offer my congratulations to the newly sworn in Councilor Coletta and express my excitement to work with all of you on the new legislation proposed today. A member of my staff will be present for the meeting. I look forward to reviewing the recording. Sincerely, Councillor Worrell. Thank, thank you, Mr. Clerk. Please read the second, um, place that on file, and please read the second late file. Second late file, uh, personnel order, Councillor Flynn, on behalf of Councillor Lara. All those in favor of the personnel order, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Say nay. The ayes have it. The personnel order has been approved. A third late file item offered by Councilors Bach and Mejia. Order for a hearing to discuss utilizing American Rescue Plan, Plan Act opera funding to improve digital equity in the city of Boston. Whereas Mayor, v Mayor Wu has laid out an ambitious plan to use American Rescue Plan Act opera funding to pursue a Green New Deal for Boston and build a more sustainable and equitable, equitable city for all. And be it ordered that the appropriate committee of the Boston City Council hold a hearing to discuss using up to two million of the city's opera funding to make an initial investment in expanding digital equity in Boston through Tech Goes Home and that representatives from the Department of Innovation and Technology, Boston Human Rights Commission, the Equity and Inclusion Cabinet, in the Office of Budget Management, Tech Goes Home, and the public be invited to attend. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The Chair recognizes Council Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. And Mr. President, I ask permission to suspend Rule 12 and add you as a third original co-sponsor. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Thank you so much. Um, I will keep this brief because I know it's been a long meeting and there's some celebrating to do. Um, the councilors Mejia, Flynn, and I um, sponsored a hearing on digital equity last year um, and surfaced, I think, a lot of things for us to work on. I know um, I count myself a proponent. I know other councilors are proponents of municipal broadband. Um, digital equity specifically is not an area that's really included in the proposed ARPA proposal from um, the mayor's side. Um, and at, a, at the overview hearing that we had last week, or two weeks ago, I'm losing track of time, um, Tech Goes Home came and testified and, and asked the council to consider whether expanding their work specifically in order to forge um, relationships with up to, up to another 100 um, new uh, uh, CBOs in the city, community-based organizations, and bringing digital literacy training and free Chromebooks to up to 4,500 new households. Um, and, and also training thousands of learners um, through the affordable connectivity program that the federal government has, whether that's something that we could consider funding within ARPA. Um, and actually since that time, the Biden administration has announced some further federal support for that ACP piece. And so basically, just as I had asked counselors to file um, doc dockets related to potential ARPA um, appropriations, and thank you to folks who have been doing that, wanted to make sure that Tech Goes Home's proposal came in kind of formally to the council so that it could be something that we discuss in the upcoming hearings. So that's the idea of filing it today, is just to kind of get it on the docket and give it its own um, agenda item. So uh, I'm grateful to Councillor Mejia and Flynn, who have been partners on this issue for a number of years now, uh, and hoping that we can really bring this to the floor as we, as we continue to talk about how to best use the city's ARPA funds, especially because the American Rescue Pl Plan Act itself actually specifically called out and contemplated like digital equity and broadband services and stuff as an area for funding. So thank you so much. Mr. Thank you, Councillor Bach. The chair now recognizes the second original co-sponsor, Councillor Julia Mejia. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, and thank you to my co-sponsors, Councillor Bach and Flynn, for all their work in the digital equity space. We are in an era <coughs> where access to the internet is no longer a luxury that some people can simply go without. The internet is a utility as important as sewers, roads, or public schools. It is also a tool that is used to connect people to resources, information, community groups, and it's time that we started seriously investing our COVID relief dollars into improving 
in order to access across the city. We learned that during the BPS remote learning, nearly 3,000 students lacked reliable internet access. There are even more people in my own office who struggle with obtaining reliable, stable internet access in their own homes. This is an issue that impacts everyone and it is crucial that we're putting our COVID relief uh, money towards this effort. In the past, our office has called for municipal broadband, even, with, even securing thousands of dollars in the last budget season to conduct a study on how we can, as a city, move towards creating internet access as a public utility, not as a privilege. I look forward to this hearing and working alongside my colleagues, Councillor Bach and Flynn, to move the work forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. I now recognize Council President Ed Flynn. Thank you, Council Royo. I'm proud to join my colleagues in sponsoring this as a co-sponsor. I know that during the pandemic, residents in my district and residents across the city as well, but a lot of residents in public housing um, had a very difficult time accessing the internet so that they were able to do their studies on, at, at BPS. In many cases in public housing or large buildings, apartment buildings, if one child or one student was on the internet doing their studies at BPS, there wasn't enough power for the second child to access the internet as well. So only one child at a time could be on the internet. Um, we've worked with several groups on this issue in the past, Tech Goes Home, they do incredible work. They did a lot of work with um, residents in Castle Square, which is on the border of Chinatown in the south end. Um, so I want to mention, mention them. But also a lot of seniors um, are without access to the internet. And I would like us to focus on making sure that our seniors are educated, but also our seniors have the ability to access the internet from their home from our public libraries as well. This is a, an incredible, important issue. And as we kind of move towards, more towards remote, remote learning and remote healthcare, um, a lot of healthcare now is on um, talking to your, your provider over the internet in some, in some fashion. So we need to make sure that all residents are engaged in, the, in this process that have the Ability to, the ability to access the internet and use it for various means. So I'm proud to um, stand here with my colleagues um, that have done tremendous work in this field for so many years. Um, thank you, Council Royal. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Uh, would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Seeing no one, uh, no one would uh, anyone else like to add their name? Uh, Mr. Clerk, please add Councillor Braden. Please add Councillor Coletta. Please add Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Please add Councillor Lara. Please add Councillor Louis Jen. Please add Councillor Murphy. And please add my name uh, as well. This late file matter will be referred to the Committee on Boston's COVID 19 Recovery. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Arroyo. We're on to green sheets. Anyone wishing to remove a matter from the green sheets may do so at this time. The consent agenda. I have been informed by the clerk that there are zero additions to the consent agenda. The chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. The consent agenda has been adopted. Announcements. Memorials. Today we will adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. Councilors Flynn, Flaherty and Baker, James Harvey, Wen King Yin, Council Lujan, Saravan M. Elador. A moment of silence, please. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of those mentioned. We are now scheduled to meet again in the Ionella Chamber on Wednesday, May 25th at 12 noon. All those in favor of adjournment say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Say no. The council is adjourned. Thank you to the city council central staff and thank you to the clerk's office as well.
Thank you. You're welcome.